education, data, equity, reluctant project manager, gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Emma Oshrin. I am coming to you from Budburst and the Chicago Botanic Garden. We are going to talk about a few different things today. I am going to tell you about Budburst as a program, and we'll talk about community science. And then we'll get into some tech products that we've done over the past three years. We'll talk about our data. And then at the end of this portion, we are going to do a breakout group. So if this is interesting to you, stick around for that. Come to that breakout group, and we'll dive into the data more. OK, so first, Budburst and community science. So Budburst is a community science project, and we bring together researchers, gardeners, educators, and of course our community scientists to answer ecological questions primarily about the timing of seasonal changes in plants. More recently, we've also worked on plant-animal interactions, which I won't focus a ton on in this talk, but we can talk more about it afterwards. So to take a step back, community science is essentially the public involvement in real scientific progress. So it's a real science project, but anyone can participate in it, no matter your age, no matter your background. You may have also heard it referred to as citizen science, participatory science, neighborhood science. It has a lot of different synonyms. We use the term community science at Budburst, so you'll hear me use that throughout the talk. So one of the other tenets of this is that the data are free and publicly available for anyone to use, as is the case with Budburst, which we'll talk a little bit more about. So at Budburst, we study phenology. And this word may be unfamiliar, but I guarantee you, you are familiar with the phenomenon of it. So phenology is the study of the timing of seasonal changes in plants and animals, although at Budburst, we mostly focus on plants. So if you've ever noticed flowers coming out in the spring or leaves changing colors in the fall, you're already observing phenology. All we ask you to do at Budburst is to snap a picture and give us a little more information and send that data to us. And then we collect it not just locally in Chicago, but on a national and international scale. So for phenology, the way we collect these data are looking for seasonal changes in plants, also called phenophases or different phases of phenology. And we essentially have people just look at each plant part. So this might be the flowers, the fruits, or the leaves, and tell us what that plant part is doing at any given time of year. So here we have an example with a silver maple, and you can see the progression of different phases you might see throughout the year. We've got flowers featured on the left. They might look different than flowers you might see in a garden, but those are the flowers on this plant. We've got young leaves in the section like C and D and unripe fruits. And then as we progress throughout the year, we've got mature leaves and ripe fruits. So by each different plant part, we're asking what it's doing at a given time of year. And phenology is important for a number of different reasons, but the primary reason we study it at Budburst is because it helps us understand and predict the impacts of climate change. Now, we know that our springs are getting warmer, and they're also happening earlier in the calendar year than what we've seen historically. So spring-like temperatures are happening earlier and earlier in our calendar year, and this pattern is only going to increase as time goes on. And now, we all live in Chicago. That might not sound like such a bad thing. Early spring sounds great. Sounds great for us, partly because we've got temperature control. But this can have unintended consequences for plants. So for example, let's say we have an unusually warm early March. 
the plants that are responding to temperature cues are going to think it's springtime. It's spring-like temperatures, so we'll go through a spring pheno phase, which means they put out buds and petals, their flowers are blossoming, but you all live in Chicago, you know that in early March, we're still gonna have a storm. It's still gonna drop below freezing. We're probably gonna get snow. So now we have our plants that have gone through this early spring pheno phase, earlier than we've seen historically, and then we get a late winter storm that damages blossoms and impacts fruit production. So we have this unpredictability of the weather that impacts plants. Now, we at Budburst study plants, but we study plants because they affect everything else. So plants interact with their pollinators, they interact with organisms that rely on them as a food source, and we are also organisms that rely on plants as a food source, so this impacts our food production as well. So we study plants, but we do it in part because it can tell us about entire ecosystems. Now, Budburst has two central aims. We have a research focus and an education focus. I am going to briefly touch on both of these different areas today. So first, we'll talk about our research projects. We have three concurrently running research projects right now. I am only going to talk about phenology and climate. So if the other two are of interest to you, pollinators and climate or milkweeds and monarchs, definitely ask me in the question section. But we're not going to go into too much detail about those right now. So our phenology and climate project is the core of the Budburst research program. This is our bread and butter. This program has been running since Budburst began in 2007. So it's a relatively long running project. And it's also our easiest and most accessible project. So we ask people to track seasonal changes in plants, which lots of people notice anyway, even if you're not thinking about it as a scientific observation. And you can do this plant, or you can do this project on any plant at any location. So no matter where you are, what you have access to, you can participate in this program. We've had people collect data on dandelions coming up in the sidewalk. So you can participate in this no matter where you are. And there are a few different ways to participate. You can participate relatively casually, which might look like when you go on a walk in your neighborhood or on a hike somewhere and you see a plant blooming, you snap a picture and you say, I'm in Chicago, this plant is blooming, and it's June 13th. You send us that data. You may never walk that way again. You may never see that plant again, and that's fine. It's just a snapshot. It's just one observation. That data is valuable to us. The other way you can participate is if you're visiting a plant over and over again that you see repeatedly. Maybe in your backyard you have a tree and you see that plant go through every single phenophase throughout the calendar year. You can also give us information at each of those time points. You can send us info weekly or daily, whatever you want. We love that kind of data as well. So you can participate really casually all the way to giving us daily observations, which by the way, most people don't do. Um, but you can participate as really as involved as you want to be. And like I mentioned before, we are asking people to make observations by different plant parts. So you can see an example of that at the bottom of this screen. These are what we call our phenophase wheels, and they're by plant part that are probably familiar to most people, flowers, fruits, and leaves. And the cycle around the wheel is intended to represent the cycle that you might see annually for that plant. And this is just an example with a specific type of plant that has flowers, fruits, and leaves. Not all of them will. And in that case, you would see different wheels asking for different plant parts. Uh, we can talk more about that if we have more time too. This is just an example for how we collect our data. So now shifting into Budburst as an educational tool, we have also been an educational program since 2007. This was really the core of how Budburst began. It was intended to be an educational project. And we hold true to that as one of our central aims. So we have Budburst curriculum that is free and publicly available on our website, designed for students pre-K through higher ed. So a, a, pretty, a broad spectrum, and the curriculum is aligned to next-gen science standards. So if you're an educator, if you know an educator, we have free curriculum for you. 
Uh, we also have family activities for pre-K through eighth grade. Those are more like one-off, one-pager activities. Uh, and then we offer educator trainings and professional development, both in person and online. And we are in at least 670 classrooms across the country. Those are just the ones that we know of. So those are educators that are using Budburst in their classroom to teach a variety of subjects uh, like plants, animals, ecosystems, data analysis, the list goes on and on. And then I also want to mention work that we do locally. So this is a national and international program, but the bulk of our programming is based in Chicago. So we work with community organizations like Enlace and Neighborspace. We work with the Chicago Public Library System. We're in all 81 branches of the libraries. We work with local CPS schools and Waukegan public schools. We install gardens. The students help us install gardens. And we work with the forest preserves of Cook County. So this is just a snapshot of what we do locally. That's a quick overview of Budburst. And now we're going to get more into the tech work that we do. So Budburst has had a few homes over the years, a few home institutions. And with those different institutions, we've had different websites. And these are just a couple snapshots from, uh, I pulled these from the Wayback Machine, 2017 and 2020. This website, I was around when it was in use. It did look better than this in real life. The Wayback Machine, there's something wrong. But um, anyway, these are previous versions of our website that we've had in the past. But then in 2020, we got funding, which is how everything happens. So we had a pool of money that we could use to redesign and relaunch our marketing site, our web app, and then to build a mobile app for the first time. So this was a pretty big change for us, especially that mobile app piece. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this work progressed, what we did for this project. And I'm sharing my perspective mostly as someone who got this job uh, in June of 2020 and did not have tech experience before that. I had the science experience, which is how I came to be in this position, but no prior tech experience. Uh, and that is also the case for the entire Budburst team. So we all started our new roles in June of 2020, three full-time staff, brand new, no tech experience. And we started our work on these tech products that same month. So first day on the job, I got a mood board. I had to pick one or the other, I chose one, and we were off. And I'll tell you the story about that. So for our design work, oh, so we'll get through this timeline, not all of it in detail, but this is an overview of what we did. You'll see this again. First, we'll start with the design work. So we worked with a local agency, Merge World, to design the marketing site, the web app, and the mobile app. And this was a steep learning curve for us. Like I said, none of us had prior tech experience. We did have two internal web developers that worked with us part time. They're uh, science department web developers at the Botanic Garden. So they were on the team and they were part of translating some of this work, but the full-time Budburst staff didn't have any tech experience. So a lot of this was merge translating tech to us for the first time while we are actively doing it. So for instance, we didn't know what a sprint was in the context of tech, and we were learning what a sprint was while we were doing sprints, and also not really sticking to the timeline of a sprint because we didn't know we were supposed to be sprinting. So for example, bit of a, a learning curve for us. The other piece is that we had a public facing project that already served 16,000 users. So we had what I'm calling legacy users where we wanted the transition from our previous tech into our new tech to be as seamless as possible where there's not any downtime and where they're not too unhappy with any decisions we make from the old tech into the new tech. And we also want to make sure that the new products we're designing are easy to use for new users that we're hoping to attract. That was one of the main pieces that we wanted for these new products was to simplify and have them be really easy and user friendly. So we've got these two different pieces of our audience that we're trying to please simultaneously. 
The other piece is that we have a relatively niche program. It's a science project, there's a lot of vocab words, we have our own jargon. So in the process of Merge explaining the tech pieces to us, we were also explaining the science to Merge. So it was also us doing science communication live, trying to explain things that we know might be important from a science side, but if you're unfamiliar with the science or you're just coming onto the project, like Merge was, you wouldn't necessarily know that. So there was a lot of information transfer in both directions. One example that I wanna give is talking about our wireframes. So these are our wireframes. We got these from Merge. And when we got them from Merge, we didn't know what a wireframe was. We'd never heard that word. We didn't know what it was. We didn't really know what the purpose of a wireframe was. So we got these designs or these wireframes from Merge and they asked for feedback from us. So we were giving feedback that was like minutia, details that didn't matter at this phase at all. Like this word is misspelled on this page or these buttons are not lined up with each other or we have to move this link over to this side of the page rather than this side of the page because we didn't understand that a wireframe is not the final product and that there are gonna be a lot of changes that happen after we're in this phase. We essentially thought this is what we were getting plus color and pictures filled in which uh, delayed the project in terms of the feedback we gave. It was way too much information. And we didn't know we weren't supposed to be giving that kind of information. And we also didn't hear from Merge, don't give us that kind of information. So it was a mismatch in communication where we were doing too much and we didn't know, we weren't calibrated yet to know what was the appropriate level of info to give at this stage. But we moved forward, we figured out what wireframes were. We worked with Merge and we eventually did get designs, some lovely designs. Uh, and then from this design step, we moved into the actual build. So in September of 2020, we transitioned, done with our work with Merge and we moved into the build with Titan Co. Titan is another local tech agency and they built our products. Uh, they built the marketing site and the mobile app. The web app was built by our internal devs, but we were working pretty collaboratively with them. So Titan did an exceptional job of managing our expectations. They taught us what it meant to work in an agile way. That wasn't something that we were familiar with at all, had no background in that, hadn't heard that word in this context again. And they also made a real emphasis on making sure that in the, pro in the project timeline that we had, which was not long, they were gonna create something functional for us. So they explained the concept of a minimum viable product, which again, we weren't familiar with. And they explained to us that they weren't going to work on the first three screens of the app and have them be beautiful, all the details, bells and whistles, and then have the rest of the app not work. That they were going to make sure from end to end we had a functional product that would work for our users. And any time that we had for bells and whistles, we would add on at the end. We would add new features as we were able to. But it was a real lesson in prioritization, which was my job for this program. We had to figure out what were the priorities that we needed to set in order to deliver a functional project. And then the other piece is the project manager that we worked with from Titan was wonderful. And she did a great job of explaining the tech progress from week to week in a way that made sense to us. So we would log on, get our update from the devs, and they would have worked on one screen which from us, our perspective, that doesn't seem like very much. It seems like we could do this in a couple hours, but that's because we don't know what we're talking about. And so then their PM walked us through the process of what it took to make that screen. All of the hours, all of the detailed components that go into making just one screen. And that's just an example. But there was, she did a wonderful job walking us through what is needed for each step so that we weren't thinking that our money was being wasted or our time was being wasted because we don't know what goes into building something like this. We are able to launch the marketing site and the web app in February of 2021. And then a month later, we launched our mobile app. This is um, for the first time we had this mobile app. So it was a brand new product for us. And then 
Somewhat separately, we got funding to be able to do a bunch of things, but as part of that funding, we were able to translate all of our materials and also pay for the tech to bring Titan back in to create bilingual functionality in our web app and our marketing site and the mobile app. So a little bit separate, but obviously part of the same big picture. So in July of 2021, we launched the bilingual version of our products. And we contracted with Titan throughout for operating system updates. And this is just a snapshot of a few pieces of the site. So we've got resources for groups who want to do the project. We've got resources for educators. These are some of the curriculum that we have on the site. And we think that it looks nice. Hopefully you do too. So this is the um, a final version of what the site looks like, not the wireframes. And then we have our mobile app available in I for iOS and Android. QR codes up on the screen. They'll pop up later too. Uh, and one of the really great pieces of this is that, is there anybody in here who's heard of iNaturalist or participated in iNaturalist? Yeah, okay, great. So iNaturalist has an organism identification tool built into the app. We were able to use iNaturalist API in our mobile app so we have plant ID technology in our app using their tool, which was a really great addition to this. That is a quick overview of our tech. Now I'm going to jump into a little bit more information on our data. Budburst as a project has been running since 2007, like I mentioned. And over that time frame, we have nearly 30,000 community scientists that have collected over 270,000 data points. And these are in the US as well as internationally. So we have a global distribution. The majority of the data points are from the US, but we do have folks from all over the world. And we also have data that is mostly focused on the project we talked about today, our plant phenology work, but we also do have data on our pollinators and our milkweeds and monarchs projects. Those started respectively in 2017 and 2020, so they've been running for a lot less time. So we have much less data, which in some ways makes them easier to process, but we can get into that in the breakout group. Uh, the other piece, as I mentioned, one of the tenets of community science is that the data are free and publicly available. So anyone can look at these data, anyone can use them for whatever you want. And the groups that often do or that we hope more and more will is high school classes, undergraduate classes, graduate students and faculty researchers who want to ask their own questions of the data, and of course, the general public. So if you have a question that you're interested in and it's within the realm of our project, you can just explore the data on your own, ask that question yourself. There are a number of different topic areas that our research can address, and this is really just the start of it. There are a million different ways you can explore the data. That's one of the advantages of having this large data set, uh, but it can be plants, seasonality, plant pollinator interactions, the list goes on and on. So this is a view in our web app of what it looks like on our data page. Uh, this is a logged in view. If you're logged out, the background's green, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. So you can see all of our observations are here, and then there are ways for you to filter and sort the data on the left. So the search on the top, you can search by a plant's common name or scientific name if there's just one species you want to look at. Otherwise, on the left-hand side, you can filter by time frame. You can filter by state, so any region that you want to look at. You can filter by plant groups, which is a designation we didn't really talk about today, but it's a way that we group plants that have different phenophases. You can also look by observation type, which are the three research projects, one of which we talked about, two of which I mentioned briefly. And then the last checkbox is the budburst official species, or budburst species only is what it says. We have something called a budburst official species, which is essentially a designation for species that are in our database and we have a, a wealth of information on. And that designation was a little more functional before the iNaturalist integration. Previous to that, we had our 450 budburst official species, and then a user could add a species that they saw that wasn't in our database. With the integration of iNaturalist, we now have 250,000 additional species. So the distinction is a little bit less functional than it used to be, but it still can be a helpful guide because those are the species that we have the most data on because it's what we've had historically. 
And then the last checkbox is to include or exclude youth observations, which is a quick and dirty way to clean the data in some capacity. Now, I want to acknowledge that there are assumptions built into that. It assumes that all of our adult submitted data is of a high quality and that all of our youth submitted data is of a lower quality, which is not the case. We have high quality data from our youth. We have less high quality data from some adults. So it is just a quick way to make a designation that helps in some capacity, but it's not perfect. But it's one way of cleaning the data. And then you download the data, you get it as an Excel sheet, it comes to your email, and then, oh God, it looks like this. So this is what you get in your inbox, you open up Excel, and this is what the data really looks like. So this is maybe not overwhelming if you all are experts in data analysis. I know we've got folks in here who process data weekly. So if you've got data analysis experience, if you're a scientific researcher, this might not seem so bad, you could process it, you could code something to process it. I think that's what we're gonna do in the breakout group. But if you don't have that experience, this is not very user friendly. There are a lot of columns, there's way more on this side that aren't even in this image. We've got field names that are clear to our developers and are not clear to a user. We've got acronyms that aren't explained anywhere. So this is not a super user friendly data set. We are working on a data use guide that will give people a step-by-step -step for how to get the data, and then once you have it, what columns you can delete that you don't need to use, and what columns might be most useful so it's a little bit cleaner and more manageable for folks that don't have a data processing background. But this is what it is currently, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more about it in the breakout group. I want to go over some high-level pros and cons of using community science data. This is also what applies to Budburst as well. So it's more general, but these apply to my project too. So the pros are you can sample a large area that you would never be able to do on your own. And with that, you also get a high volume of data. We have people adding data all the time in the background. It's also cheap. Community science is cheap. Um, not every part of it, building a mobile app was not cheap, but a lot of community science data collection can be done on the cheap, um, and it's much more cheap than if you as one scientist have to fly to all of these different areas. You're letting other people collect the data for you and their volunteers. Uh, it also can be extremely effective. There are so many examples of community science data being used for scientific publications, not that that's the only metric of success, but community science data is used regularly. Um, the kind of best example of this is birders. Birders who collect data uh, annually are, it's like a great example of effective community science. And then more and more community science is respected within the scientific field more broadly. We're definitely on the up and up in terms of that, but see the cons column. Uh, and then in the cons column, we also can see that the data are messy. We just looked at that Excel spreadsheet together. There's a lot going on in that data. Uh, it's also patchy. So we've got areas where we have a lot more observations. Chicago and Illinois is a hub for us, as you might expect. We have other states with other partners that give us a ton of data. And we have some states where we don't have very much data. So we've got patchiness in the data which then leads us to bias. So there are a lot of biases in our data set. We've got the geographic bias, where we've got some hubs of a ton of data, and then we've also got bias in that lots of people just wanna take pictures of pretty flowers, which is totally fair. But it means that we've got a lot of data on flower blossoms, and we don't have so much data on fruits or on grasses, which, by the way, do flower, but it's just not so showy. Uh, we also have varying levels of training. Some people just pick up the app and start making observations, and some people go to a webinar, they read everything on the website, they email us questions, and then they collect data, which is fine. We want our app to be accessible to folks who don't have that training, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and that leads to variable data quality. And then the other piece is that Although we are coming up in the scientific field as being well regarded, there's still plenty of work to do to convince more traditional science that 
this is a viable means of data collection. I'll wrap up quickly. So you can use Budburst by contributing data. We'd love to have you contribute. And I know this group does a lot of data processing, data analysis. So please analyze the data. If you are an educator or know an educator, please use our curriculum. And then I didn't go into this at all, but we have partners like nature centers, other museums. So if you're from an org and you think you might like to collect data officially with Budburst through your org, ask me about that. And I want to acknowledge that I'm not the only person behind this project. This is our full team. The first three people that you'll see, those are full-time Budburst staff. Owen is our current web developer. Kay and Jennifer are co-PIs on the project and have been around since the very beginning. And then Bianca and Charlie are not with the Budburst team anymore, but they were our two internal devs during the build. So I wanted to still highlight them because a lot of this work was theirs. And lastly, we have a job opportunity on the horizon. It's not live yet, but we will be hiring a business data analyst. This is full-time contract work. It is partly Budburst, 20% Budburst time, and uh, partly Windy City Harvest, which is another project of the Chicago Botanic Garden. So I'm not hiring for this role, so I can answer some questions, but not all of them. But I will send the actual job ad when it becomes live. And... Looks like formatting got messed up on this one. Um, but I'll take questions, and you can email me too. And that QR code will take you to our website. Um, this might be like super wonky, but I'm really curious about the iNaturalist like, API. Like, can you say more about how that works? Is it like you're taking a picture and it's like sending like a video I think to like something to like analyze it so like how's that even work I'm just kind of curious yeah so let me preface this by saying <clears throat> I will do my best to answer the tech details questions but again I still don't have a ton of personal tech expertise but uh, so the connection with the API is something that was negotiated a little bit before my time and as far as I know the way that their API works is it's been it's machine learning. Um, so they've trained this algorithm on images and it has learned how to recognize different organisms. The one that iNaturalist uses is for all organisms. They do like a broad biodiversity study globally. The one we use is just a subset of theirs focused on plants and it's also not perfect. So it works best on full blossoms of, of nice, beautiful flower. That will give you the most accurate read. And even so, it's still not perfect after that. So it's good to ground truth it, start with species you do know, maybe start with species that are labeled like at an arboretum or in a park. Um, so yeah, and that doesn't, I don't know, maybe not as much info as you wanted, but. I guess that I have a question then based on that is like, do you all do any data cleaning as a follow-up to like verify anything or would that be like an additional, because you could potentially crowdsource some of that too. Yeah, that's a really good question. So it is the question of my year really. Um, so we have not done data cleaning historically. There has not been a, a method for it. The um, like include or exclude youth is kind of the, the most that we have in that area. But I also will say that we've talked with other organizations that are similar to ours, other plant community science orgs, and there isn't really data deletion as a policy. It's more like, um, plus wanting things that are high quality, so that things that are lower quality are still present in the data set. They're not removed, but they just maybe aren't validated. Um, so that's, that's the method that some orgs use. And um, we don't quite have that aside from include or exclude youth, but it's something that it would be great to have and is on my mind for sure. Could you talk about some of the findings that have come from uh, the data that's been collected with Budverse that might be interest to you or us? Or Yeah, let me, okay. I have some slides in here, but they're at the very end of my extra slides. So close your eyes. <laughs> what we have is 
What often happens is that not just the bud burst data set will be used, but for folks that are doing broad scale phenological studies, they'll use multiple data sets. So for instance, this paper, a Chung et al. from 2011 used the Budburst data set. They also use a data set from the National Phenology Network, which is a very similar organization, uh, and then maybe even others as well. So oftentimes it'll be a pooling of a lot of different data sets. And what they were doing in this paper was looking at cherry blossom bloom uh, in, I think they, yeah, in the DC area. So it sounds a little bit like who cares, but the reality is the DC cherry blossom blooms are such an economic driver in that area. And they have the cherry blossom festival, people fly in, people drive in, they book hotels and Airbnbs and they spend money on food. And it is becoming harder and harder to predict when cherry blossoms will be in their peak of the bloom. And also when that peak happens is shifting. So we are seeing this earlier shift in blossoms happening with cherry blossoms, but really it's the variability that is a problem because they have to predict when peak bloom will happen and tell people so they know to plan their flights and to book their hotels. And if they're wrong, it's a huge problem. So that's one example of the way that our data has been used uh, in a more, in a scientific publication. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, is around the idea of the community science work that you all are doing. Mm -hmm. Do you all have like a partnership already established with uh, areas around the city? Uh, are these groups uh, affiliated in any type of community gardening settings? Yes, so we have a lot of partners in Chicago, Chicagoland area in many different capacities. So we work with a handful of community organizations. I mentioned Enlace and Neighbor Space. We work with Faith in Place. We have worked with Project Exploration. Um, we work with Instituto del Progreso Latino. Um, who else? And, and we work with the libraries, which is kind of their own category. But we work uh, on all, with all of those organizations, we do our Milkweeds and Monarchs program with them. So we have events where usually we'll go to a partner's physical location because as some of you probably know, the Chicago Botanic Garden is not in Chicago, it's in Glencoe. So usually when we're running programming, we come to our partner sites and we'll bring plants and gloves and trowels and everything that we need. We'll plant a garden at their site and we'll do some educational programming, teach people hands-on how to make observations, how to do the, the process of collecting bud burst data and, and a handful of other things. So that's what we do with community organizations, with the schools, it's, Similar, it has been historically on a different project that's not really running anymore, so I didn't mention it. But what we're doing with schools, for instance, this year is our pollinators project. So it's a similar thing where we'll come to the school. What we're doing with schools now is not planting gardens at their sites, but doing some container gardens and also helping them ID plants on their grounds so they can use them for observations. And we work, we have a lot of partners that are kind of hard to categorize. We work with the forest preserves, we work at the libraries, we have partners that are not in Chicago that are the official bud burst partners. That just means as an organization, they agreed to collect data. So that's like other botanic gardens, uh, other nature centers, some state and local parks. It is, it varies quite a lot. But yeah, we do programming with a number of different orgs and the schools here. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, just curious if there were certain plant species that I guess were more robust to the effects of climate change, like they um, maybe other species that were blooming earlier, but they still kept their timeline and why that might be? That is such a good question that I do not have an answer for. I don't know off the top of my head ones that are more robust to climate change versus others. There are certainly some that are 
sensitive that we know we're seeing shifts in, like cherry blossoms are an example of that. I think we also see some changes in lilacs, um, but I don't know ones that are are more resilient to it off the top of my head, but it's a great question, and maybe you could come to the breakout group. So um, two, 270,000 data points is, uh, it's very respectable, but I, am, uh, I, I imagine that I, I, I naturalist has like many more. Are they sharing their data with you? No, they do have many more. So iNaturalist is uh, definitely like in terms of these plant studies, and they do more than plants, but they're the gold standard. They really took off. Um, they are global in their reach, and we're global, but they're, they have millions of users. Um, so yeah, different scale for sure. Uh, we don't share data, but that this is a, such a good last question. So we have talked with them in the past about what it would take to do that, and it would be really hard and really expensive from the tech side, from the back end, trying to integrate all of our data. But I am part of a collaborative project funded by NSF that started last year that's with me, iNaturalist, uh, National Phenology Network, three different other universities. And what we're doing over the course of the next three or four years is building a global integrated phenology database using machine learning, using plenty of stuff that I am not an expert on either. So we are building a, a way, a platform, so that all of these various different data sets that are variable, they might measure slightly different things depending on that program and how they built it out, we're basically coming to a um, lowest common denominator, a course level of data that we can have that's all in common and integrating that on a global scale. So there will be a way to do that in a few years. Cool, awesome.